had three. So I'm going to ask you just to pay attention. I'll try and sew them together with the help of the Holy Spirit. We want to be in Luke chapter 9 to start with. And then we will go to the book of Mark afterwards, chapter 16. And then we'll jump over to Corinthians. Praise the Lord, Luke chapter 9. In verse 43 to 44, it says, And they were all amazed at the mighty power of God. Someone say power of God. But while they wondered, everyone at all things Jesus did, he said unto his disciples, Let these sayings sink down into your ears. For the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. In one verse, they're amazed at his power and everything that he was able to do. You can read a bit more about the context of demons being brought under subjection. But Jesus turned to them and said, I want these sayings to sink down into your ears. For the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. We'll come back to that. I'm going to go to Mark chapter 16. And I want us to, again, just focus a little while because the context of this is, is too important to just um, skip a few verses. So I'm going to read from verses 1 to 8. It says, And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came under the sepulchre, at the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulchre? That's interesting. They were going with spices. <laughs> they were going to do a job. Despite the hindrance that they knew was going to be there. So they asked the question, how are we going to move that stone away? And they looked and they saw that the stone was already rolled away. <laughs> For it was very great. And entering into the sepulchre, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment. And they were affrighted. And he said unto them, be not affrighted. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way. Tell his disciples and Peter <laughs> and Peter <laughs> that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him as he said unto you. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulchre. For they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. I want to give you some unpleasant news, which is, this is originally where this chapter finished. When the canonists were putting the books together, they said, we need to summarize the real ending because it can't end here. Because it ends with them saying they were afraid. So what happens from verses 9 to 20 is really the canonizers summarizing what happened next. Just in case, if you were to only read the book of Mark, that you wouldn't be left thinking that it ends with them saying nothing to any man because they were afraid. I am intrigued by this because I'm a literature student and I studied this book under a secular teacher who was just looking at the historicity of the book and, and the value of how it got to us and what happened to it. So this is not a secret, but it's not something we talk about much as preachers because we don't like to in, in, infer at any point in time that there may be something changed about the word of God. We're nervous about those kinds of statements. 
But you need to understand the intent of Brother Mark. He was a dramatic man. And if you look at the pace of his gospel, it's the fastest gospel. In this gospel, Jesus is always doing things suddenly and quickly. And so he wants to give you the impression of a fast-moving Jesus, who also says in this place more than others, what I'm about to do for you, don't tell anybody. So Mark's book is full of, is much more hurried and full of a bit more mystery. And he wants to end it dramatically. So he ends it by saying they went out quickly and fled from the sepulchre and they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. That's how he wanted this book to close. In the two scriptures I've read you so far, there's two sides to both of them. There's, there's the joy, first of all, at seeing the power of God. And then there's Jesus saying, I want you to pay attention to these words. Son of man's going to be taken into the hands of men. Then at this, we see at the beginning, they're coming down to the tomb. They want to anoint him. And they should be happy because the stones rolled away. But then they're so scared because this is unprecedented. They were afraid. The final verse I want to read to you from 2 Corinthians 13, verse 4. Paul writes this. He said, for though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. Someone say the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. I want to speak to us for a few moments this morning on when weakness is a strength. When weakness is a strength. A lot of preachers won't want to preach this because we would rather tell you let the weak say I'm strong. And we don't want anything to do with weakness. We, we, we know, don't let the enemy see you cry. And, you know, we, we don't want people to be weak, but there's a type of weakness the Bible speaks about consistently that turns out to be a strength for the believer. And I want to walk you through some of these narratives this morning to help you, maybe in your situation, where you maybe feel like, I'm helpless. There's nothing more I can do. And understand that this is a divine opportunity for God to intervene. When we look at these narratives, when we look at, you know, we know the end of the story, right? We know what's going to happen. We know that Christ is going to have the victory. And sometimes, saints, in glossing over the scriptures and in reading very quickly, we can almost think like every day was great and every day was victory. And Jesus was just such a great healer and, and everything always went well as long as Jesus was there. Jesus had to prepare the disciples for periods of weakness, for moments in time where they would not have all the power and might of God behind them, making them feel like, you know, I'm top of the mountain and I'm always winning. He tried his best to prepare them for the moments where they would be in moments of weakness. Now, not every weakness is a strength. I think we understand this. Judas had a weakness. It didn't turn out to be a strength for him. John summarizing it says, because he didn't love the money. You know, John, John in his narrative is he's very, very sharp. He says, when the woman was pouring out the oil, Judas got up and says, why, why this waste? This could have been sold for something and, and, and given to the poor. John narrates behind him and says, yeah, it's just because he liked money. Judas' weakness was money. Why do you think he sold out Christ? He's seen Jesus walk on water. He's seen him calm the raging sea. Do you think if I betray the Son of Man into your hands that you could really hold this guy? He saw him escape through crowds of people when it wasn't his time. Jesus, the Judas made a miscalculation. That's why he took his life. If he really was just going to be okay with the arrest of Jesus, then, then he, he wouldn't have killed himself. But his weakness for money made him take a calculated risk. That if you think you can capture this miracle man, even if I kiss him and show you who he is, <laughs> you get away and I get the money. Win-win. He didn't, he didn't want to see Jesus crucified. 
that he would have that he would have stood at Calvary and went, ha ha. The man took his own life because of a weakness. David had a weakness. <laughs> Someone said he was a womanizer. David had a weakness, and his weakness wasn't the strength. Looking out of his window, should have been at war, gets distracted, then makes a number of calculations to cover his tracks. I mean, this was premeditated stuff. This is, you know, you could you could say the first one was spur of the moment, but after that, it was very carefully meditated. I'm going to send the husband to the hottest part of the battle. This was a weakness. This weakness wasn't a strength. The kind of weakness we're talking about here is when you are incapable of impacting the outcome. Jesus says, I know that right now you are feeling great about what I just did with that devil that you couldn't cast out. You are amazed by the power of God. But it's one thing to understand the power of God. It's another thing to understand the will of God. Because the power of God doesn't always follow the will that you have for your life. The power of God doesn't always follow you into every situation to give you victory the way that you would want victory. It's better to sing songs like, follow, follow, I will follow Jesus. Than to say stuff like, the Lord is on my side. The Lord is not on your side. You need to be on the Lord's side. Moses says, who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. People think that God's got my back and he's going to back me all the way. One say, oh, you better stay on the Lord's side if you want to be victorious. Because he don't love you so much to have your back when you're in the wrong. He don't love you so much that when you are being prideful and arrogant and stubborn, that he's just going to stay with you. I mean, you'll think he's with you because you're, you're still shaking like Samson, but he's not there. Oh, you've had great victories with the Lord's help before, but when you break covenant with God, you lose his covering. That's what Samson found out. He also had a weakness that wasn't a strength. And so the, the people of God were being encouraged. The disciples were being warned. And I just love the phraseology that Luke put in there. Let these saints sink. Let them sink down in your ears. Sometimes the prevailing messages that we have in our spirit is that I'm blessed, I'm highly favored. I'm the head and I'm not the tail. Wonderful. These are all scriptures. But you also need to have verses in the back of your mind that say they that live godly will suffer persecution. That the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. We need that balance of understanding that, yes, God is with us. And as much as we want to be on his side, there are going to be times where God takes us down lanes and alleys and pathways that we would never have chosen if it was left to us. And if we could change the pathway that we took to get where we were, we would do it. But sometimes it's just too late. You can't fix everything that happened yesterday. The question becomes, what can I do today? So Jesus warns them, while they've seen the greatness of his power, that they should let the saying sink into his ears that me, the Son of Man, I am going to be delivered in the hands of men. I'm going to be in a situation where you can't get me out. I'm going to be in a situation where the one who was helping you can no longer help you. And you would want to do everything you can to help me, but you can't. Peter must have forgotten that when they came to arrest him because he pulled out his sword. It was another weakness that was not a strength. Peter pulls out his sword and, and chops off the ear of Malchus. We've discussed this before. I don't know if he was a good swordsman or a bad swordsman. It's one or the other. He's probably going to try and take his head off. 
He's a fish. Go and catch fish, Peter. You're much better at catching fish. Or maybe God spared him real judgment because if he had taken off that man's head, perhaps he had never been free to be around on the day of Pentecost. When he stood up at the moment, the saying that should have sunk into their ears got them in a position where they, they'd forgotten it because they were afraid too. Peter, the man who you would think had the back, this, this act of cutting off the man's ears was telling you that out of the 12 disciples, if there was one that was going to have Jesus' back, it was Peter. If there was somebody that would never deny him, it was going to be Peter. But lo and behold, when the hero was arrested, when that covering was gone, Peter was afraid and denied him. It's, it's easy to proclaim Christ when you're with your friends and when you're hanging around the saints and when you have everybody behind you who also believes. But when you are found in a situation where you're the only one and it looks like the God you serve is not that powerful after all. When things have gone wrong in your life and people who you thought were going to live died and you were saying that God was going to bring us through and, and that everything was going to work out fine and it didn't work out. And now someone says, is it, is it you that believes in this Jesus? Peter denied him because in himself, the evidence didn't look good. The man that he chose to follow was arrested. If the most powerful person you know, and he's your leader, is arrested, and if he has not divested that power to you, then that puts you in a very frightful position. So Peter was very brash. He was boast. He was quick to speak. He was quick to defend. But when the backative was gone, when the backup was gone, he denied Christ three times. That's why when we see in the book of Mark here, the instructions that were given to the woman was to say, go and tell my disciples and Peter. Because in their mind, Peter was probably a deserter. In their mind, Peter was probably backslidden. In fact, if you read the accounts carefully, when the little girl was saying, no, you are the one, they said, Peter, swear. Cuss. Bad word. Tobacco. I don't know it. So Jesus had to say, I still have a purpose for that one too. He might not look like one of my disciplined ones, but I need to get him to an upper room. You wait and see what I'm going to do with him. God was going to bring some strength out of his weakness. God was going to turn it around for his glory. So we see these women, and I love these women. They said, we're going to go down to the tomb. Man, you have to, you have to applaud these women in their passion because they started out on a journey to do something that they didn't know how they were going to get it done. But they determined, we're going to go anyway. Because it's the right thing to do. Praise God. Do we have some believers that know how to bring themselves to church, even when their body doesn't want to be in church? You still got to find a way sometimes to do what you know you should do, because it's the right thing to do. And even if you don't know how you're going to praise him, you don't know how you're going to get your breakthrough, sometimes we come and think it. Everybody's going to see that I'm miserable and I'm tired. Don't worry. Bring that miserable, tired body to church. Do the right thing. Bring it into the presence of the Lord because God is a God who specializes in rolling stones away. He specializes in doing things that you can't do. That's what's so exciting about the Lord. Amen. He can do wonders. I felt it before I came here this morning. And I didn't know Sometimes the Lord's showing you some stuff, and I, I don't know how he was going to do it. I don't know if he needed me to do anything to make happen what I saw happening before I came here. But I saw the manifest presence of God filling this place in a tangible way. 
I saw the heat of God's presence bringing healing to bodies in the midst of worship. And I wasn't sure if it was a song I had to raise or if Sister Grace would raise the song, but when I felt the presence of God, I just said, thank you. You are here in the midst of us. That's what I love about church. On the one hand, you just don't know what will happen next when you praise him, right? I saw something in the spirit that's very hard to explain. But I'm going to try to explain to you to trigger you to understand what God is looking for. If you think about that church is happening all over the world today, and while we understand that God is omnipresent and that he can be everywhere, do you know that he is not everywhere? He is not in every church, and his presence isn't being manifested in every place. I want you to help you to understand it's not just because of the doctrines that people hold, why he is there or not there. It's a state of heart and mind. It's a state of unity and commitment. There are some churches where the people that prayed before they came to church in expectation that God would do something when they get here. They fill up the tank in heaven and they force the angels to be directed to your church address because of the way they prayed before they came to church. There are people who are praying about this service from Monday, that God would do something when we come together. Heaven is taking account of all the work that's going in. I mean, sometimes you just need to invite him enough. And then there are places where after they have sent their invitations to God, they have come in with an expectation. And the proof of their expectation is the praise that they lay out as a red carpet for God to walk in the place. The Bible says praise waits for God. Praise don't come after God gets here. Praise comes here before God like a red carpet. And God says, I see red carpet. I can come in on that kind of praise. We can always have a move of God by the way we prepare to come in his house. That's when church is most exciting. When the preacher might preach, we don't know how the song is gonna go down because the song service could wreck the service. Well, I was raised in a church where a preacher couldn't always preach. We didn't know what was gonna happen in the testimony service. Somebody might have got filled while the choir was singing, while the testimony was going up. Little mother got up and sang a little song. I just want to give a little song for my testimony. That song turned into an hour-long worship session. People dancing and praising. I love that kind of church. It doesn't happen by orchestration. It doesn't happen because we wrote up a nice program. And this is the point at which we're going to have a praise break. And here's the point at which the preacher's going to dance. That's not how it happens. It's when pure hearts, pure minds, united spirits come and say, let's just worship God until something happens. Sometimes, and you will have this testimony, I know because you're believers, on the worst week of your life, when things were going the worst for you, and you brought yourself in the house of the Lord, when you didn't even know if you were going to be able to worship God. So many folks I know got filled on the worst week in their life. When they were so weakened by circumstances. When they were so tired. When they were so fed up. When they felt like I've been tiring so long. And they finally just threw themselves on God. And he picked them up. Like this woman at the tomb. Rolled the stone away miraculously lifted the weight that was standing between them and their assignment. What a God we serve. Just coming out with the right intention. Just coming out with my spices. Just coming out with my praises. Just coming out with the right mind. God says, I'm going to move some stuff for you. I'm going to move some things around because your mind is in the right place. And you made the right journey. You didn't know how it was going to happen. But praise be to God, I see you. If you draw nigh to me, he says, I will draw nigh to you. God is a God who responds to your action. <clears throat> he responds to your forward motion. <clears throat> he said, if my, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray, 
So many of us keep thinking of God as a sovereign actor. And he's just going to do what he wants to do when he wants to do it. No, no, no. God says, I've never seen faith like this in all Israel. I'm going to do something I didn't intend to do because of your faith. I'm going to do something I didn't plan to do before the time because of your faith. The power of God is released by the faith of the people of God in him. There is a power to be released. Look, this power is here. It's, it's there. Jesus was able to demonstrate it. And sometimes we just got to get our mind on one accord with the will of God. That we don't let circumstances break our heart. We don't let circumstances break our spirit. We don't let circumstances take away our praise. Or take away the spice. Or the sweet fragrance from our testimony. Now, man, I've listened to testimony. I know some churches cut them out. And I understand why some of them cut them out. But I'm still a supporter, a believer in testimony service. But I've heard in testimony service testimonies that don't come with spices they come with bitterness you know some folks they get up they sing the song with me when it rains it pours and, and you get to the chorus but it still feels like the blues why did you sing that song there's a, there's, a, there's a bluesy spirit in you. There's a nobody know the trouble I see spirit in you. Bring some spices. Think about the goodness. Someone says, when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, I can't make what the devil saw in my meditation. I can't make what is taken from me my meditation. I gotta think about what he did. Something will happen when our mind is in the right place. Oh my Lord. Help us, Lord, as preachers to preach people to the right place mentally. That they come in the house of God with the right intentions. That even if it wasn't all good all week on the way to his house, I'm gonna strip off this burden. I'm going to lay aside this weight. I'm just coming in to praise God this week. I'm going to confuse the devil. He's going to look at me and wonder, why is he still shouting? Why is he still lifting God up? Confuse the enemy with your praise. Don't let him seep into your testimony. Don't let him seep into your exhortation. Give God glory. He'll roll stones away, sisters. He'll roll stones away. He'll do the impossible. He'll do what you couldn't even fathom and imagine. He will do those things just because you have the right intention. There's an old songwriter that said that we'll be blessed because we came. Yeah, you know, when you come out, when you really come out to his presence and you understand how to enter, that's why the David said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper. <laughs> he understood that there was a right way to come in. And even though that was seen as a menial job, he says, I'd rather get people ready to get in the house of God because he understood the blessing of being in God's presence. He understood the revelation, the insights that come from being in God's presence. He wrote in one place, my foot would have almost slipped when I considered the prosperity of the wicked. I was, I was getting so disappointed because wicked people were prospered. But he said, when I went into the sanctuary, when I went into the house of God, I understood that these people are standing in slippery places. I'm not going to envy the wicked. They're on slippery ground. Amen. I want to stay where I can get revelation, where my mind can be brought back on track. I was glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. Come on, that's not even being there, you know. That's a conversation about going. Oh, I wish I wish that you were in COVID, some people would still be happy. About going into the house of the Lord. Sister Diane, they can go to the supermarket. But I was glad at the conversation because I understand the potential. Of going into the house of God with the right mind, with the right spirit. 
My pastor used to say this because church was a little crazy. He said, don't bring them to church until they're saved. That was the pressure that our pastor used to put on us to evangelize. That evangelism wasn't a leaflet to come and hear a great preacher. Evangelism was you bearing witness of Christ to the individual. Speaking prophetically by the Holy Spirit's utterance to the individual. Convicting them till they cry. Praying with them in their home. Then bring them because church ain't going to make sense to them. You see, why, why church backslid is because we wanted church to make sense to people whose mind wasn't transformed. Those who are of the flesh cannot understand the things of the spirit. The carnal mind cannot comprehend the things of God. So what my pastor was saying is, we're going to have church, whatever happens. Make sure when they come in, they are already convicted. Because we're just going to have church, and in the midst of church, God's going to do something extra for them. They got convicted. When they come in here, they're going to get converted. Because we are here giving God glory. We saw people saved in the middle of testimony service. When the church is in a state of revival, she's not always making sure that the, you know, the tie is straight. She's not always making sure that, that everybody you know, is, is feeling so, so welcome. God must feel welcome first. It's his house. My house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. By the time they walk in the door, there's such an energy in the place, such a power at, at, at work in the house, the light that they are Pentecost, they have to ask questions. It's right for them to ask questions. Men and brethren, what shall we do? What's going on? These folks look like they're drunk. Sometimes we need a move of God that needs to be explained to other people. We got too tidy. We got too orderly. We got to come in God's house and like David, not be afraid to get beside ourselves. Oh my God. There are revelers on the streets, in the clubs, in the bars. They must have nothing on the children of God when it comes to raving. They must have nothing on the children of God when it comes to going all night. <laughs> we used to sing those kind of songs. All night, all night, all night. And it wasn't just a song. It was all night. It was through the night. Couldn't stop the musicians. Couldn't stop the praise leaders. Mothers and fathers dancing around the house of God. Nobody getting knocked over or hurting themselves. Hello, somebody. We grew up in that kind of church. The place was full, but nobody got elbowed in the face. Nobody broke their neck. I saw people dancing with their eyes closed, hooking up with people from one side of the church and the next, prophesying in the Holy Ghost. I want to be in that kind of church again. The power of God. The power of God is present. We want to continue to embrace his presence and approach him in the right way, like these women did at the Sepulchre. Now, although it looked like they were afraid, and they were afraid, they were afraid, they were terrified. Come on, these are, un we've read it time and time again, and it looks normal to us, but come on, a grave was opened up, and a young man was found sitting in the tomb, and he told them, don't be afraid. He's risen, he's not here. <laughs> So in this moment, there's disappointment because they still wanted to be able to put the spices on him. They, they loved him and he wasn't there. Furthermore, he didn't leave them a note to say, come and meet me here or there. The man that was speaking to them, he didn't give them any guidance as to where they could find him. He just said, he's not here. He's risen. He's risen. Go and tell others so and so. At that point, you have to understand that that wasn't entirely fulfilling because it wasn't what they were expecting. And in life, people of God, things can happen that we do not expect. When we have done everything right and with the best intentions, we have approached God and we have come to his house, it can still end up working out in a way that we do not expect. And when things aren't going the way we want them to go, you have to hold on to the word that you got. 
hold on to those words. They were given instructions and they had to hold on to those words and fulfill the command to go and tell the others. When it says they were afraid, and that's where Mark wanted to end it. He was okay with other people telling you the rest of the story. When we look over in Corinthians now, Paul begins to talk about these types of limitations that come to us. And he's talking about as a preacher, you know, he was in prison. There were times he wanted to go to certain churches and he couldn't get there. And I'm back in 2 Corinthians 13 verse 4. And he begins to compare his situation to Christ. And that though he was crucified through weakness. And when we look at the word weakness, we're really talking about limitations. There are limitations on our lives. And they're not all ungodly limitations. There's a limitation sometimes to the scope of your ministry, the scope of your calling. You know, Philip was limited when he went to Samaria, had a great time. Demons were cast out, people were healed, but he was limited in that he had to call the apostles to come and lay hands upon them to receive the Holy Ghost. It's a limitation. Okay, it's not that it's negative, it's just that you weren't called to go beyond that line. And we struggle with the boundaries at times that God has set around our life. Because, you know, we would all want to be like Jesus, right? And do absolutely everything that he did. But the reality is that we have been put into the body of Christ. We have been placed in a situation where we have to be interdependent upon each other. You understand? So I can say, oh, I'm, a, I'm a great preacher, but I need Sister Grace to need worship in the spirit to help me preach. I don't know if you hear what I'm saying this morning. I need the people of God to come out with one mind and one accord so we can actually have a glorious time in the presence of God. I can't do it on my own. Whereas Jesus could walk into the town and just we're limited. Yet, when he spoke to them collectively, he said, Greater works than these shall we do. So the potential of what we can do together far outstrips what we can do as individuals because we're limited. And it's not a problem that you're limited. Your, your ministry might be a prayer ministry. And you're not the person that brings the word. That's not a negative. Thrive in the prayer ministry. And, and do as much to grow in intercession and learn as much as you can about what it means to affect things in the spirit. It's very powerful. When you understand that you can help a service go higher by the way you pray, by the way you sacrifice, by the way you pray for your preachers and the way you pray for your leaders and the way, you know, as you pray in the spirit, sometimes God reveals things to you that he wouldn't reveal to other people. There are some folks that just say, oh Lord, bless Pastor Mullet. Bless him. And then there's someone who's praying in the spirit beginning to go through my stuff. Help him at work. Help him with his wife. Help him with his children. Lord, you see this? That's not praying with the help of the Holy Spirit. You're now beginning to move stuff in my life. And I wake up in the morning. I went to bed with a headache, but I woke up feeling great. Somebody prayed for me last night. Somebody understood. I was going through something. God woke somebody up in the middle of the night. That's a wonderful ministry. Might never be on the platform. Might never get a plaque or be recognized, but heaven has a record. Heaven has a record. My father's traveled to many countries, preaching the gospel, many miracles, but I still think my mother has a bigger reward. That's just my opinion, because I live with her, and I see her grace, I see her covering, I see her praying, and I recognize that it was not of this woman behind this man. I mean, he went, but she had seven children. He went on the mission field sometimes for three months at a time with four young children. Oh, she has a crown. <laughs> okay, so we, we all have a calling, but we are limited in the scope of what we can achieve. Paul says, through, though he was crucified through weakness, okay, so the, the weakness of Christ would have been, number one, humanity. He subjected himself to a human body. If you pierced that human body, it was going to bleed. If you put a sword in it, it was going to be cut. Okay? You can hurt the body. The divine was inside, but he chose a human body. He chose to be in a position where he could feel the nails. Some would like to think, oh, he, you know, he, 
he blocked the pain out because he was, no, 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 no. He was wounded for our transgressions. By his stripes, we were healed. So he went through that willingly. He felt every laceration, every whip. He felt every last bit for you and me. That was a choice. It was a limitation, but it was a choice and a necessary one. We wouldn't choose, no, no, we, we wouldn't choose that way. And in fact, he got to the limits of his flesh when he prayed in the garden. Because the cup was full. Father, if this cup can pass, if there's any other way to fulfill this assignment, sometimes, saints, there is no other way for the assignment to be fulfilled, but for your flesh to go through things that you would not want it to go through. Not a path that we would have chosen. He was limited by purpose, which we just alluded to, because he said if there was any other way, redemption was the purpose. And sometimes God has not made us privy to every purpose attached to our life. So we don't know why we have to go through what we have to go through. While we're going through it, it's not always apparent. And I can stand here as a preacher and try and give you words of compassion. And in fact, the Lord told me last night, it's very easy for preachers to speak from a point of compassion and yet not from a point of unction. I can tell you the things that I would want you to hear compassionately in the moment of your deepest problem and need. I can say God's going to do it for you. And God might not do it for you. I'm saying that because I love you. And I want it to happen. But sometimes God has a purpose that you just have to go through. And you don't know who's going to call you now because you're sick. You don't know who's going to call you now because people think you're going to die. You don't know what's going to be mended at the thought. We just don't know all the purposes. Minister Peter thought he was going to be here today. But maybe I was just meant to be alone with this young man. I don't know. God knows. He has a purpose behind everything. And so we have to trust him. Jamaicans say, when you can't trace it. When you can't find him. When it doesn't look like he has anything to do with this, I still have to trust you. Job is a picture of what that looks like. He bowed down before the Lord. Yes, he shaved his head. He humbled himself. And he recognized, God, you give. And God, you take. But blessed be the name of the Lord. To worship God. When it seems like there's nothing to worship him for. At least acknowledge that this could not have happened. If you did not allow it. Tell somebody the devil is not in control of your life. He's not in control of your destiny. And he doesn't even understand your purpose. Because he would have taken you out a long time ago if he could have. But God has a purpose for your life. And you've been preserved to this time. I'm coming down. He says, yet, though he was crucified through those limitations, yet he lives by the power of God. You see, the power of God is not just for the mountaintop. The power of God is to take you through valleys. It's to hold you in the difficult times. The power of God is not just about the victories you won. It's about the battles you endure. Because sometimes we have to go through battles to lose some limbs. Sometimes we have to go through a battle to lose an eye. Jesus said in the parable that you should pluck out your eye if it offends you. It's better that you go to heaven with one eye and make it in than to keep that eye and be cast into outer darkness. He said, cut off that, that leg, that hand. If the right hand offends you, cut it off. It was a parable. He was, I'm not telling you, I know you just had surgery. Maybe they should have cut it off. 
Hallelujah. Jesus was not talking about the natural body. He was, he was trying to tell you that sometimes there are things so attached to us. Things that we depend on so much that we wouldn't want to live without them. But sometimes we have to make tough decisions to get rid of things that are good for us. Family members sometimes, conversations, friends, sometimes even brethren are not good for us. If you can't bring a change to that situation, if you can't heal that situation, cut the situation off. If it's killing you, if it's like a cancer to you, break away from it. Sometimes there are, there are strifes within us. There are things that dwell in us. They are so attached to us. You know what we do? Rather than identify it as the work of the enemy, we say, it's just how I am. See, if it was just Jamaicans, I would have said, I saw me done. I saw me see it. That's just the person I am. You're asking me to change who I am. Yes! Change who you are. Deny yourself. If you want to follow me, said Jesus, you have to say no to you. Deny self. Fasting helps us to deny self. You see, like I always come back to fast. But it will help you to deny yourself. It will teach you and train you in a form of discipline that will empower you to cut off things that need to be cut off. The way they become easy to cut off is when you see them as the way God sees them. Fasting helps to change your perspective on things. It's not just about the power of God, but fasting helps you to say, oh my gosh, this thing is a cancer. This attitude that I'm harboring is not good for me. The way I'm treating this person is not the person that's the problem. It's in me. I keep saying that thing in that person is, is, is bothering me all the time, and, and, and then you realize it's because of you. The proverb says this, a wise man will overlook an insult. It's not every insult you need to listen to. Sometimes you have to ignore insults and still love people. And did you hear what she said about me? Oh, well, she didn't say my name, but I know she was talking about me when she said those things. <laughs> ignore it. Because sometimes it wasn't even direct today. That's just your mind. So fasting helps us to deal with me and the way I'm seeing the world. I've got to cut it off. He lives by the power of God. Though he was crucified through weakness, he lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him. What a confession. But he's saying we're limited. We're limited in him. But we also shall live with him by the power of God towards you. It's the power of God today in the midst of our weakness. Paul was in prison. Paul couldn't be mobile. He couldn't go out as much as he wanted to. God had a purpose in that. Now, maybe he wouldn't have written so many letters if he was allowed to travel so much and be everywhere. God had a purpose in his bonds. He gave him enough time to travel and see stuff and to see that the, the ministry that he had was genuine and the power of God was real enough. But now he locked him up. They couldn't hold him captive if God wanted him free. Remember what happened to Peter in, in the prison? If God wants you out, he'll get you out. He opened multiple gates to get him out. They were in chains between people. It was impossible. God put sleep on them. Opened doors, broke chains. The first remote control gate. I know some of you are proud of your gates. With your remotes. We saw the first remote control gate. The Bible said the gate flew open as Peter approached it. Your technology is about way behind God. Come on. If God wants you out, he can get you out. So if he doesn't get you out, then you have to be faithful and say, Lord, let your will be done. You must have a purpose why you have me in this prison. You must have a purpose why you have me in these chains and in these bonds and in this relationship. There must be a reason for this. Weaknesses, saints, there are stones that we can't roll away. There are things we can't change. 
And in those moments, we have to learn to trust God and his power. The three Hebrew men, and I'm going to try and come down, they put it this way. They said, we ain't going to bow down to this idol. Our God is able to deliver us. And if he doesn't, we're still not going to bow. That's the attitude the believer needs to have. Oh, he can heal the sickness. I believe he can heal the sickness. But if he doesn't do it, I'm still going to praise him anyway. He can use any vehicle he wants to take me out of this world. I can't get to choose my transport all the time. But I'll praise him anyway. And I'll not bow. I'll not give in to despair. I'll not give in to discouragement. That's not the God I serve. There must be a purpose for this. Earthly inconveniences are opportunities for divine intervention. Earthly inconveniences are opportunities for divine intervention. Learn not to murmur. Learn not to complain. David said, you know what I'll do? I'll bless him yeah. at all times. And his praise shall continue to be in my mouth. Yeah. That's, what, that's what our job is. Yeah. In the book of Hebrews, they talked about all these heroes. And they didn't all die having the victory. But they said, these all died in faith. They believed God. Against hope, the Bible says, they believed in hope. Hebrews 11, 32 to 34, he says stuff like, you know, what more should I say? Time will fail me to give you the roll call of people who trust in God when the times were hard. He says, they quench the violence of fire. They escape the edge of the sword and out of weakness were made strong. Out of limitations, God showed his strength and his power. Paul put it this way. He says, he says, when I am weak, in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 10, when I am weak, when I'm limited, then am I made strong. Because in my limitation is an opportunity for God to demonstrate his divine power. When I can't do anything, when there's nothing left in my tank, because my life is in God's hands, I can sit back and say, Lord, what do you have in store? What do you have up your sleeve? Listen, sometimes even in death, God can get glory. A young friend of mine died age 18. We were both, I was 19, he was 18. On the basketball court, had a heart problem that nobody knew about. Doctors couldn't find it, they checked his blood, but when they passed away and they did the autopsy, they realized he had an ventricle that was just facing the wrong way all his life. It was never fully circulating. Young believer, a brother, we prayed together, we fast together. We were an unusual group of young men. We didn't just get together and play games. We got together and we prayed and we fasted and sought the Lord. I'm like, Lord, how could you take this young man? He had so much potential. After this young man died, the house of God was so full of young people that got to hear the gospel. And a whole family, grandma, Grandfather, son, daughter, children, all gave their life to the Lord. They said, when we saw these young people sing and praise God and have so much joy, even in the midst of so much sorrow, he said, we got to leave this Catholic church. That's what he said. We don't feel that over here. There's going to be something here that's different that they can behave like this. One soul seemingly lost but gained by heaven. And about six other souls coming to give their life to the Lord. We don't always know God's economy. Our lives are not really our own. They belong to the Lord. I don't know what you're going to do. Let's stand to your feet this morning. I don't know what limitations are upon your life right now, but I came to encourage you to trust the power of God. Trust the power of God. And out of weakness... You too can be made strong. In sorrow, God can find a root to bring you joy. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Build your hopes upon things eternal. And whatever happens, keep the praises of God in your mouth and on your lips. I'm going to hand over to Pastor Solomon this time to close us.
In Jesus' name, God bless you. So I say praise the Lord. Praise God bless you. We have gone pretty well and uh, we have five more.